We should celebrate the triumph that was involved in bringing peace to a country after two or more decades of just desperate conflict, genocidal terror, invasion, civil war, two million people being killed, and the fact that we were able to negotiate an effective and sustainable peace uh, was something still I think we can be, be very proud of. But what we did not succeed in doing was generating democracy and human rights. That was very much part of the intention. The Paris Peace Accords paid at least as much attention to those issues as they did to the peace and economic prosperity. But uh, things did go badly wrong. They went wrong rather quickly uh, when, after the first election, which was a huge triumph, those of us who watched it happen, I don't think we could ever have been more moved than seeing those millions of people lined up with threats of Khmer Rouge bomb attacks, but nonetheless grannies and little kids just really, really wanting to have a say in their own future. Uh, but that was not to be. The first election went off the rails. It didn't result in the victory that Hun Sen, the leader, had expected. And uh, he insisted on playing a role as Joint Prime Minister, the international community went along with that and it was downhill all the way thereafter. So it's been a, it's been a pretty sad tale over the last 30 years. Yeah, now he has as a firmer grip on a country as any one could. The tricky part is we're at this period in history where uh, authoritarian rule is becoming uh, more common. So what international mechanism is going to be willing and able to try and effect any further change? Well, it's pretty obvious the Security Council of the United Nations is dysfunctional, uh, completely jammed now with mutual vetoes from Russia and China. And none of that sense of optimism that there was in those early Cold War years. It's pretty obvious that ASEAN, the regional organisation, um, is a bit of a bust when it comes to applying any kind of effective discipline to its own members, as we've seen over Myanmar. I think what we've got to really rely on is, first of all, of the courage and resilience and commitment of the Cambodian people themselves, which has really been pretty phenomenal, but supported by countries like Australia, which are capable of putting pressure on the regime and really capable of, of creating some kind of momentum for change. I mean, one of the big things that we could do here in Australia is apply this Magnitsky legislation, so-called over the Russian, after the Russian dissident who was tortured and killed for exposing corruption. It's legislation that is in place in the United Kingdom and the United States and Canada. And the government here has said that they're going to be willing to enact that in the next few months. It's a bit of a triumph of uh, hope over experience to think that there will be strong legislation and some strong action taken pursuant to it. But if there is, it can take the form of financial sanctions, freeze on assets, travel bans, visa bans, stopping people having their kids educated here in Australia, which a lot of the, these people, including in Cambodia, are very wanting to do. So there are, there are pressure points that can be applied, but ultimately I think um, we have to be realistic. It's going to be a long haul and we might have to wait until Hun Sen, who's been in office now for 36 years there, uh, finally uh, shuffles off the mortal coil and uh, creates a new dynamic which gives some opportunity for those forces of democracy and real commitment to human rights to, to finally be heard. Yeah, you spoke recently about how Cambodia is so bereft by corruption, is so crippled by corruption. Um, it's in the worst 10% in the world globally. And of course, yeah. COVID has just added to their woes. So, you know, how is this country coping at the moment? Does it need further support financially? Yes, it does, of course, um, from the community through traditional aid, vaccine support for COVID, and just general support for um, decent infrastructure development. I mean, Cambodia is very reliant on China for support. And for all practical purposes, uh, Cambodia is a bit of a wholly owned subsidiary of China, I have to say, and they have benefited economically. But there's a huge amount of inequality within the country. The, the rich have benefited, uh, the top potatoes have benefited, but the ordinary people are pretty much suffering. I mean, um, there's a huge level of poverty, people hovering on the poverty line. And uh, the corruption, as you say, is, is absolutely endemic in the country. 
So again, it's a matter of a lot of international pressure, I think, needing to be applied. I mean, the trouble is with these things. I mean, you know, when peace is finally achieved, and we have had sustainable peace, now people think the job is done. But it's not over when it's over. You've really got to stay there for the long haul and create the conditions for, for decency in governance. And that does mean sustained pressure from the wider international community. And I think Australia does have a particular obligation, given the role that we played in generating the initial success of the peace talks, to, uh, to apply that pressure in a way that really will make a difference. And you talk of it being the sort of wholly owned subsidiary of China. China itself is is going down the same authoritarian path, very hard path, very hard to make an impact on the way Xi Jinping is wanting things to play out. Well, of course, and that's the the bigger game, I guess, than anything to do with Cambodia or Myanmar or anywhere else. We're all preoccupied and concerned with it. And I think um, again, it's just a matter of making it clear to the Chinese government that soft power really matters, that reputation matters, that credibility matters, that decency matters, and that they will be much more effective in getting their way in becoming a, you know, a major player equivalent to the United States and the global community if they're seen as a, a country of some decency rather than a country that's becoming ever more authoritarian. Again, these, these things are very, very intangible and very, very frustrating uh, and very difficult to achieve. But the main thing is to hang on in there and to be optimistic and to be confident that the people of these countries really do want change. You get a lot of cynics and skeptics saying, well, you know, human rights, democracy, these are Western values. These are not really what Asian countries are about. They just want, you know, economic returns. That's absolutely not true. And I go back to what I said about watching those millions of people lined up for that overdue election in 1993. Anyone who watched that with tears in their eyes could not but be impressed that this is a country that wanted to be governed with decency and wanted to have a say in the way in which it was governed. And that's that's a universal human instinct. And I think we have to recognise that. And sooner or later, these various authoritarian governments around the region, around the world, I think are going to have to come to terms with that. Mm. And important to remember that things do move on, do change. Great to talk, Gareth Evans. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you.